Hi, my name is Richard Bilderbeek and I continue the lesson about testing for the UPMAX programming formalisms course. Um, and this is the second hour. And the second hour starts with the problem, how do we work together well? Uh, imagine a team with a lot of different people, um, different coding styles. How do we work together with as little friction as possible? So imagine that uh, we have, uh, for example, different way of writing our code with different indentation styles. Um, how do we agree on something easily? How do we enforce this? Um, so, and that, that that's a tool that can help a lot. Um, the which is which which is will will be solving. So, f for example, you can encourage and you can uh, or enforce that. For example, that code, the, the already written code must pass all tests. So if there's code that's already there, it should keep passing its test else. Um, so people cannot break code anymore, unless sometimes code does change and it's okay to fail the test, but then that should be fixed as well. Uh, you can also encourage or enforce that there's a high code coverage. This means the percentage of code that is being tested. So uh, some people aim for 100%, some people aim for above 60%. Uh, you can pick your, your favorite number there. Also, you can encourage or enforce a uniform coding style. How much indent do you use? How do you place your brackets? Uh, do you just double quote or single quote for your strings? Um, you can encourage that uh, and, and enforce that. You can also check, for example, if you have a GitHub repository, if, for example, all the URL links are valid, and you can even check uh, if uh, the markdown documents or maybe even the coding, uh, the text in the code is of correct spelling. Uh, in that way, for example, not putting broken links on your website or being notified that links are broken. Uh, correct spelling is useful if you um, if you if you're not very certain about your um, your, your your spelling typing um, how how strict you are with that um, and to be able to do all this it's called continuous integration uh, and continuous integration that means in practice that uh, you do continuous integration when you trigger scripts when pushing your code to, for example, GitHub or GitLab or Bitbucket. And this ensures quality. Um, for example, it ensures that your tests pass, that your code has an inconsistent style, that links are valid, for example, not broken, the spelling is good, and you can add as much tests as you want here. Um, I will now go to into a bit more detail of each of those using more formal words. Well, one of the things that continuous integration does, it increases the number of bugs being exposed um, because it doesn't, you don't need to do manual starts of a test. It's just always ran. So you set up once and you profit all the time afterwards. And it increases the speed at which new features are added. Like you can just add some new code, push it and even continue working on, even if the tests take very long to run, um, you just continue. Uh, so there's no fear of breaking things, because if you break things, then you'll find out quickly uh, without doing anything extra, except for watching if it still works. So the code coverage I already mentioned, this is the percentage of code being tested, and that correlates strongly with code quality. Um, and uh, so people aim for 100%, uh, some people aim for above 60%. Uh, but there is, for example, this peer review community called R Open Sci. If you do R programming, where you can submit your R packages, um, there they expect a hundred percent code coverage. And also doing this will result in you choosing a different and better software architecture uh, because you want to get that hundred uh, percent. And maybe in the last one percent, that's where all the interesting bugs are with the corner cases that you need to solve as well and test for them. Your coding style is when you follow a, a consistent way of writing down your code. And we know this improves software quality. And then Python PEP8 is a paper that uh, is a style guide for Python code. And this can be enforced by tools. In R we have the tidyverse, which can be enforced by tools as well. 
And part of this coding style can even be the cyclomatic complexity. I know some programs that test for style, they also check for cyclomatic complexity. Uh, and cyclomatic complexity is the complexity of the function. And in practice, this means, and to be a bit more precise, it means how many way the computer can go through the code. Like if there's an if statement, well, it can go in the if statement or not. If there are an if statement, uh, two if statements after each other, then it can go into the first one, yes or no, and then the second one, yes or no. And uh, that's already a complexity of four. Um, if, and, and those, you want to limit that complexity. Um, I know, for example, in R, there's a cyclomatic complexity maximum of 10. Um, and that's reasonable to ask of a function. You need to, you are forced to split up your functions to ensure that the complexity is low, and that leads to um, a better code because the and and because that leads to simpler code that is less complex and easier to do a bug. And we know that more complex code is the more bugs there will be in it, which is completely no surprise. So in Python. Uh, there are many, so a coding style tool in general is called a linter or a lint or a, and in Python, uh, rough is one, sonar is one, PyTy, black, well, these are all linters used in Python. In R you have linter, for example, in C++ you have uh, OC lint, OCD lint. Well, there are plenty of tools out there and uh, these tools can also run on continuous integration. So if you push your code to GitHub, then it can be triggered that a linter will go through your code, checking for style, giving an error when it fails. So in this example, I'll be using rough because that's what we use in the course, that's what I use in the course. Uh, in general, um, the, 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 this will vary a slight bit, but it will same, follow the same principle. So rough checks for style, but sometimes there is a problem with this style check, and these, these exceptions should be rare. Um, for example, here I have a, a trivial function where I draw a random integer, which is from either 0 or 1, and let's say it's some example code or some simple testing code. Then Ruff will give an exep exception. It, it, will give, it will give an error, it will complain, because this is not cryptographically safe. And if you use, if, if this is very important code, if you want to be cryptographically safe, then you should never use randint. But in this case, uh, this is very simple code. Let's say I'm just, this is even maybe part of a test. Then you can disable rough complaining by using hashtags to start the comment, no car, colon, and then the rough error message. It, it, it will give you that error, S311. And you can look it up, you can easily Google it. If you do that, you will need to defend this in a code review because you should prevent, you should avoid disabling those tests. But sometimes the, the, the noise a linter gives is not worth the trouble of fixing it all the time. So that's why you, you and your team need to find out where that balance is. But in general, um, the less, the more strict you are, the that the cleaner your code will be. When aiming for 100% code coverage, and uh, so that means that all your functions are tested, how do you test this function? So it's a function that just prints hello world. Well, you can test, for example, by calling it, and then, for example, nothing should happen. That gives you 100% code coverage. But nothing will prevent me from writing a different text here because that can't be checked at least it can't be checked by python or maybe it can be checked by python if you read the console output and check for the word being hello world or maybe using a bash script or a shell script um, to call this function save it to a file load the file check the file for text um, in general you should just never write untestable functions you should be able to test this function um, and for example, what is special about this function is that the word print, that's a built-in function, so we don't need to test this. Um, the string hello world is what makes it unique. So we're just going to isolate um, the special thing about this function, which is the, the string hello world. 
and then we can just assert that what comes out of this is equal hello world and from that moment on we can be sure that when we call the function get hello text um, it returns the text hello world because we can put that in one problem when testing for a hundred with for code coverage of 100% is testing indeterministic functions. So those are functions that do not always return the same values. Um, for example, so those are functions that uh, sometimes have, for example, randomness in them. So here's a clear function. It calls, uh, it's, co it's called Flipcoin. It produces a random Boolean. That's exactly what it does. It draws a random integer number from 0, 2 and including 1 so that means either 0 or 1 and if that 0 or 1 is bigger than 0 then uh, return true let's go let's go back where I was there it is how do you test these well this is a bit of a problem but I'll t uh, um, I'll show here um, that, 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 that we need to know something about um, how random numbers are generated. And this slide I skip for now. Uh, we need to know about randomness. So computers cannot draw random numbers. Uh, they can't, they're, they're very precise. So what for drawing a random number, there's some kind of algorithm being ran that produces a, a sequence of numbers that is, has the same properties as a random sequence of numbers but computers can reproduce those sequences exactly because they they they, well, they, they calculate it themselves and to start to, to be able to produce the same random number generator sequence you do what is called you set a seed so when I do random dot set five seed 5 it means set the random number generator seed to 5 and then um, flip coin will be true and I've tested this I have known that I know this code is actually run um, so I know that if I call flip coin after having set the seed to 5 then always flip coin will be true and I can do this over and over again if you set the seed to a number it will always produce the same sequence of random numbers. And then um, you just need to figure out which seed works for your test. So, for example, I also want to see, make sure that Flipcoin sometimes returns false. So apparently for me, I need to set a seed of two. And in that way, I can determine if Flipcoin indeed sometimes gives a true and sometimes gives a false. Well, I want to, I want to put an uh, an exercise for this. Um, we're going to write this function flip coin, um, and for that we're going to pair up again. We switch roles every three minutes, or after a TDD cycle. Really stick to max three minutes. Discuss how to keep the time first. Uh, for example, every three minutes, uh, and after a cycle, the person with a GitHub username that starts first in the alphabet goes first. Work on the master branch only of the shared repository. Use git push and git pull to, to, to pass the code between the two, between the driver and navigator. And try to be exemplary in that. And um, here's some more technical stuff. Create a form of the fork of this repository. Uh, modify the readme to get your own username in. Develop this function flipcoin in these two files. And as a bonus, get all the CI scripts to pass. So there is another exercise after this. It's called, um, it's called roll dice, which uh, is a same indeterminate function to roll a dice. You can also do that. It should return a number of one, two, and including six. And try to develop it as exemplary in a team as possible. So I wish you good luck with that and see you after this exercise. Hey, Dol.